Thank you very much, and welcome to this uh, afternoon session. I, I hope you can all hear me okay. Um, so as Elise mentioned, uh, these, are, these are talks which contain material which many of you probably already know to a certain extent. Uh, I, I hope you will in, enjoy them nevertheless, or at least some parts of them. Uh, you, uh, there's this mantra about mathematicians, which you may have heard, uh, which says that mathematicians are like hobbits, uh, and that they like uh, having things they know very well set out plain and square. Um, this is, I'd heard this in various sources. I don't know who came up with it originally. I see. Can you understand me better now? Okay, that's better. Um, so nothing has been said so far. <laughs> and I actually, this morning, I went, I went into the Lord of the Rings book and I looked up this quotation. It really is there. Not mathematicians, of course, but hobbits. Um, so let me talk about uh, the uh, uh, Gibbs distribution. I would like to introduce this thing, which is uh, one of the central things in statistical mechanics. And I would like to give you uh, first a motivation. What are we trying to achieve? So we, we take, a, uh, for now, a configuration space of a physical system, which is just an ab abstract set, which contains all the different configurations the state can be in. And uh, the one thing that characterizes this system is its energy. It's a function of the, of the configuration. And I call this energy H of omega. So omega is the configuration. And an example, which I think you are by now will be familiar with, uh, this is a standard example, is the easing model. Take a finite graph, and the configuration is going to be uh, at every vertex of the graph, you can have a spin, which is either plus one or minus one. And the energy of this configuration would be you take all edges and you consider the product of the, of the uh, two incident spins um, and, you, and uh, you add them up of all edges. And that gives you the total energy of your configuration. And that's just an example. So what we would like to do is to define the Gibbs distribution. This originates from 19th century physics and statistical mechanics. And a mathematician's way of understanding this is to say we are looking for a probability distribution on the configuration space at a fixed energy, so we would like to fix this, this energy, and, and we would like to maximize the disorder, or in more precise terms, maximize the entropy. We are looking for a distribution of fixed energy and maximal disorder. And in order to explain how this goes, let me first recall the notion of entropy. There are many ways to introduce it. It's a, it's a notion that's a bit confusing if you're not very used to working with it. Uh, let me give an attempt to, to give a a sort of a very elementary overview of what it is and why we define it like we do. So uh, Gibbs originally already referred to it with this notion of mixed upness. So, so uh, it, it's a measure, quantitative measure of how disordered uh, a, a probability measure is. And informally, um, the way you can understand it on a very sort of heuristic level is you have a complex physical system which has lots of different details inside, and that the, all those details would constitute what we call the microstate, and you observe a few small number of parameters. And, this, and these, the values of these parameters constitute the macrostate. And the disorder of the system, uh, the entropy, is proportional to the number of possible different microstates that give rise to the observed macrostate. That's the philosophical interpretation of entropy. In a minute you will see a precise version a, a precise time model of such a, of such a, a more a vague uh, statement. Um, before doing that, I would just like to take the very simple example of the uniform distribution. So if you have no clue about what's happening in your system, you just guess that all configurations are equally probable. Um, and then you say that the entropy, the measure of the entropy is just the number of states the system can be in. And in fact, instead of taking the number of states, we would take, like to take the logarithm. And this is this famous formula, which is so famous, it's even, if you go to Vienna, I think you will find it on the tomb of, of Boltzmann. And, uh, and just a quick remark, why do we take the log? The log is there because we would like this quantity to be a so-called extensive quantity. So if you take two systems and you put them together, you would like the entropy of the combined system to be sum, the sum of the individual entropies. And you can easily see that the logarithm does that. So if you take uh, two systems, their, their union is going to be described by the Cartesian product of, this, uh, of the configuration space. And the uniform measure is just a tensor product of their respective uniform measures. And then you will immediately find that the entropy of the combined system is the sum of the entropies, thanks to the log. 
Okay, so that's for the uniform distribution. Now, what do we do if we would like to understand a more general distribution? There is a simple model, which is the simplest way I know of to give a link between this vague heuristic and the correct formula uh, for entropy that is used everywhere in mathematics and physics. And it's the following thing. So imagine this state space, configuration space omega, which is a finite set, uh, consists of boxes. And you start taking out balls. These balls are ordered. You have ball number one, and you put it in one of the boxes. Then you have ball number two, you put it in another box. And you do this with n balls. And the microstate, in this case, would be the full information of where you put these balls. So where is ball number one, where is ball number two, up to ball number n. And the macrostate, which is uh, a, a, an observation of an outsider, which doesn't see all the details, is just how many balls do you have in each box. So from a combinatorial point of view, you just forget about the ordering. You forget about the labels on the balls. And now you can try to make some mathematics out of this. So let's make this a bit more formal. So my vector B is the, the locations of the balls, individual balls. And N omega of B is going to be the number of balls in box omega. Okay. So the microstate is this B and the macrostate is this vector N of B. And what we will define according to this, this principle that I, I, I gave is the, um, the number of microstates associated with this macrostate n. So given a vector n, which describes the number of balls in each box, you uh, ask how many microstates give rise to this observed macrostate. And then there is an exercise, so there will be a few exercises in this talk. I encourage you to do them. None of them is particularly uh, difficult, but none of them is trivial either. Um, if you take these, these Bs, so where you put your ball to be independent, identically distributed random variables, such that the probability of putting any ball into box little omega is equal to this probability measure mu of omega, so mu is a probability measure on capital omega, then you will find almost surely, as n tends to infinity, that this Boltzmann entropy, so exactly what we had before, so the logarithm of the number of, of uh, macro, microstates associated with this given microstate, this will converge to a number, which I call S of mu, and it's given by the following sum. Okay, so this is an exercise using the law of large numbers and some maybe Stirling approximation and so on. This quantity is what is usually referred to as the entropy. It's, it's, a, it's a very beautiful and, and a, a general object appearing in many areas of mathematics and physics. So let me repeat it here. So this thing here is known as the entropy usually. So it bears many names because many people have contributed to its study. So it's, it certainly bears the names of Boltzmann, Gibbs and Maxwell in statistical mechanics. Later in the 50s, it was behind a, a revolution in information theory initiated by Shannon. Um, so it also measures the information content of, of the measure mu. Um, and it has a, a number of, of very cute properties, which you can also work out as, a, as an exercise. First of all, it's positive, And secondly, it's bounded from above by the entropy of the, of the uniform distribution. And moreover, this thing is equal to zero if and only if your state has no disorder at all. In other words, your probability measure is fully concentrated at a single site, omega. So this is a Dirac delta function at this site omega. And secondly, it's equal to its maximal value if and only if the thing is as, as disordered as possible. So, so if it's the uniform distribution on omega. Okay, so these are the basic properties of the entropy. Now, this was a bit of a digression, so let's go back to the notion, uh, the question of a Gibbs measure. So what can one do now? We can make this initial program precise. So I now have a distribution mu a probability distribution mu on my configuration space omega. The energy is just given by the expectation of my energy function h. And the task is very simple. It's, it's a second semester analysis or calculus. I would like to maximize the function s of mu under the fixed, under the constraint that the energy is fixed. This is yet another exercise, simple exercise using Lagrange multipliers. If you do that, you get the following answer. And this is what's called the Gibbs state or Gibbs measure. So it's of the following form. It's e to the minus beta. Beta is some Lagrange multiplier times h, the energy of your configuration omega. 
And it has to be a probability measure, so you have to normalize by a factor z, which is just going to be the sum of all of these factors. Okay, so another, another exercise. As I said, this beta is a Lagrange multiplier. Its physical interpretation is that of the inverse temperature. In fact, this is for maybe a mathematician, maybe the easiest way to understand what temperature is. By definition, temperature is the factor appearing in this exponential. Uh, why, it's why it's the inverse temperature, you can think a bit. If you let beta tend to infinity, this state will be entirely concentrated around the minima of H, which corresponds to very, very low temperatures. And if you let uh, beta tend to zero, this is just going to be the uniform distribution, which is very high temperature, very high dissolved. The Z has a name in physics, it's called the partition function, and uh, this is another very important physical quantity that you may see in, in, in any literature on mathematical physics or statistical mechanics, which is the free energy. It's by definition the logarithm of Z multiplied by minus T. And this is yet another simple exercise. You can work out this formula, which is a well-known formula from thermodynamics, um, no, which goes back to the 19th century. And in fact, if you, if you think about this a bit more on the thermodynamics, you, you, you will find out that the free energy, and this is a very important concept when you want to build steam engines or things of the kind, represents the available energy in a system if you want to use it to perform work at a fixed temperature. So it has a very important physical interpretation. Okay, so that, that was the Gibbs measure. Now, all of this is all good and nice, uh, except underlying all of this discussion was the key assumption that our configuration space is finite. Uh, none of this really makes sense if you have an infinite configuration space, yet in most of the things we actually want to do, we do want an infinite configuration space. And then everything becomes much harder and also much more interesting. So let me sketch a bit how one would do that. And here one has to be a bit more concrete. You can't just have a completely general theory of, of Gibbs measures on infinite configuration spaces. Um, the best way to understand it is using so-called spin systems. So you take a lattice, a big lattice, which I call L. Every site of the lattice carries a probability space that I call Ls, and it has a probability measure I call lambda. So this is going to be my configuration space. For the following, let me use the following notation. So <clears throat> I use an omega subscript, some subset is just going to be the collection of all the variables um, at sites in this subset. And I use this concatenation notation uh, to put, to, to, to split the variables associated with sites in the set lambda and in the complement of the set lambda. And similarly, I denote the product measure uh, as follows. So how to define a Gibbs measure? I will introduce a potential which is in fact a family of functions that I call phi a. So for any finite subset of my lattice, I have a potential which has the property, it can only depend on the values of omega x, where x is in a. Okay, so it cannot depend on the, the spins outside of this, this set a. And now I will define a Hamiltonian, as I did before. This is by definition going to be my energy. And, um, and now we would like to define the following Gibbs measure. Formally, at least, we would like to define this Gibbs measure, which is the same expression we had before, slightly generalized. The only problem is that this sum, if your set L is finite, this sum is all good and nice, and you can define it. That's exactly what we had before. If L is infinite, then this sum is typically infinite, and this makes no sense. So you have to come up with a much more subtle notion of what a Gibbs state is. And the way to do that was understood in a, in a very beautiful observation of Dobrushin, Lanford, and, and Ruel, um, and let me give you a sketch of that, of how that goes. The basic idea is you, you fix uh, a so-called boundary condition. So I will call omega the red stuff in here. I will pick the subset lambda. Omega, I have a variable omega, which is everything inside lambda. And I have a, another, another configuration eta outside on these blue sides. And the interpretation of this blue eta is the boundary condition. I'll define a conditional energy, and this is the key object. It's going to be this energy, the same one I had before, except I don't want to take an infinite sum. So I will take a red set, which is finite, and I will take a sum only over those sets A, which touch my finite set lambda. Okay, so this just means it has to touch my set lambda. Think of the easing model. In fact, this diagram is drawn in terms of the easing model. And I define the conditional partition function which is just the partition function in terms of this guy here. Now, 
recall that this depends on the set lambda I have chosen and also on the boundary conditions, eta. And then there is a, a, this fantastic observation by, by a DLR, which is called the DLR equation. And I'll leave this as an exercise. It's just a computation. You have to do integrals. It's half a page. Um, I recommend you do it. If you take a finite lattice L, then this Gibbs state here makes sense, complete sense. It's a finite sum. And moreover, you can verify the following equation. So you take some observable f, which is just some function, and you integrate it with respect to this measure mu. This is the same thing as integrating with respect to the same measure, the boundary conditions, then regarding the boundary conditions as being fixed, and integrating this observable with respect to the conditional Gibbs measure, with respect to these boundary conditions. Okay? So the notation, it's important to choose good notations. This is my attempt. I think this is relatively clear. You can do this exercise, and once you have this equation, this now, for finite lambda, is an equation that makes sense even for infinite lattices L. So we define a Gibbs measure on an infinite configuration space to be any probability measure that satisfies this equation for all finite subsets lambda. That's the definition of a Gibbs measure. It's a good definition. It's a rather indirect definition. Then you can ask about existence and uniqueness. Existence is relatively easy under some reasonable assumptions on your potential. By a weak compactness argument, you take increasingly large sets, subsets of your infinite lattice, and you show that this has a weak limit. Um, uniqueness is much more subtle, also much more interesting. In general, it's wrong. And these Gibbs measures form a, a complicated convex set. Uh, and if this set is non-trivial, uh, it means in the physics jargon that you have, you have phase transitions, coexistence of phases, and sensitive dependence and boundary conditions, and so on. And these are all notions which emerge only in the thermodynamic limit when you take an infinite uh, lattice, and they are uh, the starting point to study them is typically such a DLR equation. Okay, I think my time is up, so I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Auntie. Uh, due to the short timing we have for basic notions, we'll postpone questions to either the coffee break or later after talks, since session organizers are mostly on site, or you can actually contact them quite easily. Um, our next speaker is going to be Julian Sonner from the University of Geneva. <laughs> and we'll start at the end. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so uh, unlike the previous speaker, I'm not a hobbit, I'm actually a physicist. And so um, I'm going to have fewer equations, but I'm going to try to give you an overview of what is perhaps a slightly bigger area. So um, the talk is about ADS-CFT duality. So let me start by asking, what is a duality? So since you're all here, you either already know or you have come to know the notion that some countries have more than one official language. So maybe you took an airplane here to Genève, or maybe you took the train to Genf, but you all arrived at the same place. And in fact, a duality in theoretical physics is very similar. It involves two or more different mathematical descriptions of the same phenomena. So you might use the mathematical concept of metric in one of these descriptions, uh, but you are referring to exactly the same phenomenon as if you were to say state uh, in the other description. But what's important, of course, is that like in this linguistic analogy, there exists a dictionary, and also is actually called a dictionary by the practitioners, to help to translate from one side to the other. So I hope to be able to explain some of the entries of that dictionary to you. So, um, well, first of all, I should say that dualities as such are not at all uncommon in theoretical physics. Um, for example, one that is simple, I think, and that I like a lot, is what is referred to as particle vortex duality, which is something that people in the field of theoretical condensed matter study. And it's saying that there exist two descriptions of the same uh, physical phenomenon, either in terms of a particle like an electron, or uh, in terms of uh, a soliton-like object, like a vortex. Um, whatever uh, language you choose to use, all physical predictions will agree. 
okay, once they have been mapped in the uh, appropriate way using the dictionary. What is special about this ADS-CFT duality, and which is why um, I and many others uh, work on it, is that it involves gravitational physics, it involves gravity. So let me state uh, what this duality is. Of course, this is very vague. I will try to be a little bit more precise in particular towards the end. But um, this duality basically tells us that uh, quantum gravity, whatever that is, um, in a particular space, anti de Sitter space, ADS, is in fact uh, just a different way of referring to what we might call um, quantum field theory, so a quantum mechanical object, uh, on a particular fixed background, let's say a flat background. So I have this little lowercase a in front of ADS, anti de Sitter space, and that's actually because really precisely we talk about all, uh, all solutions that are asymptotic to ADS. So what is ADS? Well, ADS is a geometric notion. In fact, it's a maximally symmetric pseudo-Riemannian manifold that I want to define in d plus one dimensions that has constant negative curvature and is known as anti-de Sitter space because the positive curvature solution was introduced by Willem de Sitter as a possible uh, background solution for our universe. And so when you reverse the sign, you get anti-de Sitter space. Now, um, another way of, of defining it is that it is a Lorentzian version, so a, a different signature version of hyperbolic space or Lobachevsky space. A particularly beautiful visualization also in this context is this uh, woodcut by Escher, circle limit four, which uh, is of course a mathematically exact but very pleasing depiction of the hyperbolic plane. And it also, the, the also illustrates this notion of a duality here between angels and demons. So um, why gravity? Well, it's not just the Lobachevsky geometry. In fact, we think of the Lobachevsky geometry and its deformations. If we think of the dynamics of the deformations of a geometry, we're talking about gravity. Uh, but we're also talking about quantum gravity, and in all of the cases that we actually are familiar with, uh, I mean in an operational sense, a mathematical sense, um, this quantum gravity theory is actually what we call string theory on such asymptotically ADS spacetimes. So spacetime because it's a pseudo riemannian manifold, but basically think of it as the Lobachevsky geometry. Let me just make one observation about this uh, Lobachevsky geometry. In fact, it has a group of isometries of isometric deformations, and this group can easily be understood to be uh, the special orthogonal group with uh, d plus two dimensions with the strange signature two comma d, so two time-like and d space-like directions. Uh, a particularly easy way to see this is that we can actually understand this geometry as being like a sphere, a pseudosphere that is embedded in some higher dimensional flat space, and of course spheres have SO symmetries, and the strange uh, signature just translates to the two comma d of the SO group. What is a CFT? Well, a CFT is a conformal field theory. So it is a quantum field theory in D dimensions, in my definition, which is equipped with a particular kind of symmetry, a very high degree of symmetry. It's actually the conformal symmetry. Well, conformal transformations, as the name suggests, are transformations that leave angles invariant. So they change shapes, they can change volumes, but they leave angles invariant. So a conformal transformation of flat space is a transformation of coordinates x that gets sent to x prime, such that the metric g gets sent to g prime, which is just some function times g, and that function is positive and is usually denoted as omega squared. Now, um, it is a fact, just a few computations away from this definition, that in d-dimensional flat space, well, first of all, that such transformations form a group, so the composition of two conformal transformations is still conformal, and there exists inverses and so on. But the group of all such transformations is precisely this object that we have met before, namely this special orthogonal group with signature 2 comma d. So, um, just as a comment, we have now essentially met, maybe not established, but met, heuristically, the first entry in this dictionary. Somebody might say, ADS isometries, and someone else might say conformal symmetry of flat space, but they're actually referring to precisely the same object, namely SO2, D. Um, now, much more heuristically, but much more physically, actually, what is the physical content of such a duality? Well, 
the really the, the physical content is often summarized in terms of what we call the holographic principle. The clue is really already in the fact that I talked about d plus one dimensional anti de Sitter space, but only d dimensional conformal uh, group. So the way that this actually works is that we can think of ADS d plus one as having, in a sense, a boundary. This is in precisely a conformal boundary, because in some sense it's an infinite distance, but it nevertheless can be rigorously defined. And so on this ADS boundary, which is now one dimensional lower, d dimensional, we should actually picture as this conformal field theory, it really lives there, okay? So it is on the boundary of my bulk space-time, and the bulk space-time being what I'm labeling here as the ADS interior. So um, what this means is, however, that if I'm supposed to really take this duality seriously, then everything I can say about the interior, about this volume, can be said by using the language or formulating a sentence on the one-dimensional lower surface. So somehow the entire information content, the entire geometrical content of this volume is encoded on its surface, just like in a hologram. Uh, this, from a physics point of view, of course, sounds completely crazy because we always think of uh, the number of degrees of freedom of a system as being extensive with the volume. The thermodynamic limit to which the previous speaker alluded to, for example, typically means that you have to have degrees of freedom that scale with the volume. However, it is known since the late 60s, early 70s, due to work by Bekenstein and Hawking, that there exist objects, in some sense the most simple, the simplest and most important objects in the theory of gravity, namely black holes, which violate this intuition. Um, it is known that the entropy, so the logarithm of the number of microstates of a black hole, actually scales extensive with only the area of a black hole. A is a suitably defined version of the area of a black hole, and the 4GN is just a particular convenient choice of unit, units where h bar and c are 1 and so on, Boltzmann constant equal to 1. So this property of black holes can actually be argued and has been argued by Atoft and Susskind to be a general property of anything that gravitates. So the idea is that gravitational physics in general emerges from a lower dimensional hologram. And in this particular ADS-CFT duality, this is explicitly correct. And the lower dimensional hologram lives, if you want, on the boundary of the volume. So let me tell you about a couple more entries in this dictionary. So we have already talked about ADS isometries and conformal symmetry. Um, one might talk about the metric. Um, so for example, deformations of this space, like maybe you have a galaxy in there those are the same as the distribution in the state of energy and momentum of this quantum field theory. The ripples or the perturbations actually um, encode the correlation functions of all sorts of uh, operators, fields, and objects of the quantum field theory. So when we say ripples or when we say correlation functions, what we really mean is a mathematical object, W of J, that generates all possible correlations of fundamental operators. But this last one, this last entry is one that is particularly nice and one that I want to explain in somewhat more detail. Um, the notion of an extremal surface in this geometry actually maps in a very precise sense to the notion of entanglement in this quantum field theory. So, um, well, this is also an illustration of why this duality is so exciting, because it illustrates why, um, um, what it buys us. So, again, going back to my linguistic analogy, what is sometimes hard to express in one language may be much easier to express in another. So if I go to my East German version of Lando Lifshitz volume three and I look at the index, I find the entrance entry Drehimpulswahrscheinlichkeitsdichteverteilungsfunktion. I don't know what your language is, but I suppose that the expression for this object is easier. And the same is true about ADS-CFT. Entanglement entropy, computing entanglement entropies, is extraordinarily difficult in quantum theories. If we instead think of it through this duality, it maps to a very simple object in a very simple computation, namely that of determining the minimum area of a surface uh, in the pseudo-Riemannian geometry. The formula was proposed by Ryu and Takayanagi, and it goes as follows. 
Suppose we're interested in the entanglement entropy, so the von Neumann entropy of the reduced density matrix of a subregion R of the boundary. So the blue, the blue interval here just stands for some subregion. And I think of what is the von Neumann entropy of this, so I trace out all the other degrees of freedom, so the remaining red degrees of freedom. As I said, if you wanted to compute this in quantum field theory, you would be uh, trying to pronounce Drehimpuls, Wahrscheinlichkeits, Verdichte, Verteilungsfunktion. But here, all you need to do is you take a boundary anchored minimal surface that is anchored at the, uh, at the boundary of the subregion R, and you just minimize some functional, like in calculus of variations, you get an area, and the extremal area, sigma divided by 4gn, gives you the answer you want. This formula looks very similar to the Beckenstein Hawking formula of the black hole entropy, and that is not a coincidence, although I have no time to go into why. Um, using the simplification, I think we can say that a lot of interesting results have been obtained and a lot of interesting work is still going on, which some of which will be covered in our parallel session. Uh, so, quantum aspects of black holes. Uh, the idea of how non-locality of space-time can be understood. How quantum information, so this entanglement entropy being one example, can be geometrized. Um, many other uh, 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 areas, I just want to highlight one more, namely that of N equals to 4 super young mills theory and integrability, because there will be another basic notions talk by my colleague Niklas Speiser tomorrow. And I want to conclude by um, at least uh, giving you one more idea why this N equals to 4 super young mills theory is actually interesting in this context. So Niklas will tell you all about this theory tomorrow. So to conclude, ADS CFT or holographic duality defines quantum gravity as an emergent phenomenon. This is uh, incredibly satisfying for a physicist. Conversely, it allows to geometrize quantum field theories, uh, uh, um, so it allows us to understand objects that are not geometric in a very geometric way uh, in a surprising sort of formulation. But what are um, outstanding issues? Well, you could, of course, uh, also uh, try to work on some of these vines in this beautiful vineyard, but the really big open questions, for example, would be, can you prove this duality? For example, in cases where I can tell you precisely what the conjecture is, namely that the n equals to four supersymmetric quantum field theory in four dimensions with SUN gauge group is supposed to be exactly the same uh, physical content as type 2b string theory on ADS5 times S5. And from a physicist's physicist point of view, maybe one of the most important outstanding and unknown issues is, can such an idea, holography, actually work for spaces that are not asymptotically anti-de-sitter but are asymptotically flat or asymptotically de-sitter? Because those are, after all, better approximations to the universe that we live in. Thank you for your attention. Thanks a lot. Our next basic notion is going to be by Chiara Safirio, who will tell us about the Boltzmann equation as soon as I put it. Um, hello, everybody. So uh, the basic notion I want to speak about is uh, uh, the Boltzmann equation. Can you hear me? Yes, good. Um, so how can I uh, move to the... Oh, okay, thank you. So the Boltzmann equation is an equation that was introduced at the end of the 19th century by Boltzmann and Maxwell, who were attempting at describing uh, the behavior of a rarefied gas. So let's start immediately by looking at the equation. So the Boltzmann equation is, uh, the unknown of the Boltzmann equation is a probability density on the phase space as a function is a function of time, space, and velocity. The left-hand side here is just the action uh, on the unknown f of the free transport operator. And this models the fact that your particles in the gas are moving freely uh, up to certain times at which the right-hand side of the equation enter into the play. And this uh, right-hand side uh, is described by this uh, nonlinear operator, which models collisions among particles. So this operator has uh, an explicit form that if you see it for the first time might look very um, ugly, but the physical meaning of it is, uh, is very simple. So you might think of uh, uh, two particles, for example, our spheres, which are colliding, 
and they uh, meet each other uh, before collision with velocity v and v star, then they collide, and according to some scattering rule that typically preserve uh, momentum and energy, they change their velocity into v prime and v prime star. So this is what this right-hand side uh, describe, collisions between two particles. So um, this equation um, has nice uh, features. So uh, it conserves mass, momentum, and energy. This is a very easy computation to do. And uh, um, it has also a most, more interesting uh, feature, that is that one can define the Boltzmann entropy associated to it. So Antti already uh, spoke about it. So here is the version in the continuum uh, space. This is just the integral in space and velocity of f log f. So what Boltzmann already proved in, 1970, in 1872 uh, is that if you have a sufficiently smooth solution of the Boltzmann equation, then uh, the entropy decreases along solutions of the Boltzmann equation in time. And uh, this, uh, um, uh, of course, uh, this means that uh, your initial Boltzmann entropy, that is just the inverse of the physical uh, entropy, uh, bounds the entropy at all times, uh, at later times. So uh, this, in particular, uh, tells us that the Boltzmann equation uh, describes some uh, uh, time irreversible phenomena, despite that uh, this is obtained from a microscopic system of time reversible, um, of a time reversible microscopic system. So um, let me first focus on uh, a PDE viewpoint, so about well posedness of this equation. So if you uh, look at the homogeneous setting, that means when the uh, unknown of your system, your uh, function f, uh, just depends on velocity, so there is no space variable, then there are many results after the um, pioneering work of Karleman in 1933. So situation in this case is quite well understood. If you um, want to take into account also positions of your particles, and then you have the inhomogeneous equation that I wrote on the first slide, then there are different uh, possibilities you might look at. So first of all, if you are fine with just the local in time existence, then this is quite easy to obtain. There exists a unique solution, a strong solution local in time. Um, if you want to go for a global in time results, then you have to restrict yourself to small data or data close to equilibrium, and this is uh, something that was more recently obtained by the School of Yang Guo from Brown University. And uh, um, if you want to look at uh, global existence for uh, general data, then you have this notion of renormalized solution that was introduced by uh, Dipern and Lyons. The problem with this uh, uh, last uh, uh, class of solution is that uh, uniqueness is not known. So, from a general point of view, when you want general data, uh, global well poseness is still an open problem, and I want to convey you the idea that this is really something that is tricky, it is not clear uh, what to expect. So, from the one hand, in fact, if you look at the equation, you might naively think that this is an equation of the type DTF, something like equal to F square. And then you might think, okay, then um, it's um, probably you would have only local in time uh, existence. On the other hand, you see there is a minus here. So cancellations might occur. So this might lead to a global in time. Um, existence. So this is something that for now is completely open, is a major open problem in, in this field. So let me now uh, switch to a statistical mechanic viewpoint. So uh, this equation, this is really how Boltzmann obtained it, uh, comes from the fact that you have in your gas, in your rarefied gas, many, many particles which are interacting. And these many particles, they all move according to the Newton's equations. Then you want to approximate this picture at a macroscopic scale with something that might, that it's easier to measure, so on which you can look at observables. And this is what Boltzmann did when he wrote down the Boltzmann equation. So just uh, retaining some uh, 
collective behavior of your gas without looking really at the motion of each single particle. And this is done through a scaling limit uh, passing from the microscopic to the macroscopic scale. This is typically referred to as the derivation problem, and this is what I want to briefly review with you in these uh, few minutes. So um, at a microscopic scale, then we can write explicitly what each particle does. So uh, if I denote by xi and vi position and velocity of particle i, where i is uh, running from 1 to capital N, where n is a very big number, then these are the equations in the case, for example, in which your particles are art spheres. This is complemented with, by some uh, boundary conditions uh, which uh, describe the fact that when your uh, hard spheres are at contact, then they change their velocities at the boundary. Um, so equivalently, you can rewrite the system with the Liouville equation. This is a completely equivalent description. So you define a probability density on the n-particle phase space. I denote it by uh, Fn. And you write the Eulerian picture of this Lagrangian picture here. So this is uh, just a... Uh, a linear partial differential equation complemented with the same boundary conditions. So now we are interested in a situation in which the number of particles is, is very big. So mathematically, we want to perform the limit for n which goes to infinity. And this object is clearly not well defined from a mathematical viewpoint. So I want to introduce another object, which is the j-particle marginal. This is defined just by uh, integrating out uh, capital N minus J particles, so you get an object which only depends on J, so is now completely well defined when you take the limit for N which goes to infinity. So now when I say N goes to infinity, what does it mean? What I want to look at is a specific regime that is the so-called Boltzmann grad uh, limit. So what is that? So I want uh, the number of particles to grow, but my gas is rarefied, so I also want the radius of particle to shrink to zero, and at the same time to retain the collisional uh, nature of my microscopic system. So here I have uh, my capital N art spheres uh, of radius uh, epsilon, and I want to compute which is the probability that two particles collide. And this is simply done by uh, computing the area of this cylinder here. And this is uh, simply something of the order epsilon uh, uh, to the power d minus 1, where d is the dimension of the space. So in three dimension is, for example, epsilon square. This is just because the time interval here is something of order 1. So then you have capital N particles. So the probability that two particles, whatever two particles collide, then is, this is just this area of this cylinder times the number of particles. So if I impose this quantity here to be equal to 1, um, I will keep this collisional structure in the limit for uh, the number of particles going to infinity to my macroscopic uh, scale. So this is what is referred to with the name of Boltzmann grad limit. So um, let's come back to the Liouville equation, so this one. And let me uh, write the equation for the first marginal, for example. So I integrate out capital N minus, J, min, minus uh, one particles. And what I get is uh, an equation for this first marginal, which uh, I want to compare with the Boltzmann equation that is written here. So let's look at these two equations. Left hand side, no problem. They are exactly the same object. Right-hand side, well, we have this prefactor here that is not appearing in the Boltzmann equation, but this is not a problem because this in three dimensions, this is exactly of order one because of the uh, scaling regime that we are looking at, not the Boltzmann grad limit. And then the rest, well, you see that we have a problem here because for the one particle, uh, for, the, for the first marginal here, we have... Uh, something that appears on the right-hand side that encodes the fact that there are correlations among particles, and this is the second marginal. This is not present at the level of the Boltzmann equation, where we have a factorization um, of the uh, second marginal. So, okay, imagine now that we are able to prove something that is called propagation of chaos, so that uh, if initially we take our... Um, two-point function, so our second marginal 
to, to be approximately factorized in the Boltzmann grad limit, can we prove that this stays factorized at later time? If we can prove that, then a part from a small displacement in the position variable here, then we have that the first marginal in the Boltzmann grad limit would solve the Boltzmann equation. So the whole point then is to prove uh, this propagation of chaos. And the main obstruction to prove that is uh, due to some pathological configuration that are present at the level of uh, the particle dynamics, uh, so for the equation for the first marginal, which are not described by the Boltzmann equation. So these are configuration of this type uh, that are called the recollisions configurations in which two particles that collide at one point then have their own collision history, they collide with other particles, but then at a certain time they collide again. So this is something that is not described at all in the Boltzmann equation. It's present at a microscopic scale given by the Liouville equation, and the whole thing is to prove that this, is, uh, this happens, but with small probability in the Boltzmann grad limit. So this is... Uh, the main obstruction in the mathematical proof of the derivation of the Boltzmann equation. And let me conclude with uh, what is the state of the art and major open problems in this field. So the pioneering work of Oscar Lamford in 1975 was the first uh, uh, rigorous derivation of the Boltzmann equation for our spheres for short time intervals of order one. This was uh, then later uh, made quantitative by Gallagher, San Ramon, and Texier in 2013. And then this problem has recently um, uh, received a lot of attention from the mathematical physics community, and many um, progresses have been done. So, for example, now we can treat short-range potentials, so we can even look at tripole interactions uh, among particles, but there are some problems, for example, the physically interesting problem of looking at long-range interaction potentials. Uh, this is completely open and there is no, um, uh, no result at all uh, on this line. The second major open problem concerns the time validity. Uh, so in, this, um, in recent years, then, there have been uh, uh, quite some progress in this uh, um, in this, uh, for, for the time validity. So the old result goes back to Ilner and Pulvirenti, in which they proved that near the vacuum, so where you basically have no particles. It has then been um, uh, looked at for the linear and linearized setting by Bodino, Gallagher, San Ramon, and uh, more recently the same group together with Simonella. But uh, for the nonlinear case, so the true Boltzmann equation, this is a completely uh, open problem. Apart from these major uh, open problems, there are many other problems involving uh, looking at particles interacting uh, with boundaries, uh, for example, with diffusive boundary conditions, uh, taking into account temperature, etc., the appearance of boundary layers, uh, or how to model molecular interactions. All that are problems uh, extremely interesting from a physical point of view, but mathematically uh, completely open. So, um, I want to convey the idea that this is a field in which there is really plenty of work to, to be done. Thank you for your attention. And our last basic notion of the day will be given by Marcello Porta from CISA, who will be talking about the quantum hole effect. As soon as I've put your slides. <laughs> <clears throat> All right, so, so thanks a lot and uh, hello everybody. Um, so this is going to be about uh, um, transport in condensed matter systems from a mathematical physics viewpoint and uh, uh, the effect I will discuss is, uh, well, it's the quantum hole effect. So um, let me give you uh, just a brief uh, you know, overview of what we're going to talk about. So, so I mean, transporting condensed matter is really a source of, uh, um, I mean, it's really an endless source of beautiful mathematical problems that combine uh, lots of different methods, as you will see in this case. So analytic methods, uh, uh, probabilistic tools, uh, even geometric and topological methods, uh, and so on. 
And so, so the point I would like to, to, to focus on here is transport. So what do we mean by that? So by transport, uh, I mean, essentially what we, by, by studying transport, what we want to do is to study the behavior of an electron gas. So th think about the charge carriers in a, in a material, let's say in a metal, uh, after you introduce some external perturbation in the system that is going to, let's say, you would expect it to, to generate some drift, okay? Right, so you could imagine some external electric field, uh, some variation of the chemical potential, anything that would some perturb the equilibrium state and lead to some non-equilibrium time evolution. And so we would like to do that starting from the fundamental laws of uh, quantum mechanics. So we would like to have predictions about transport starting from the Schrodinger equation, which I'm sure you know, all know very well. Right, so if you just talk about one particle described by a wave function psi in L2 of Rd, then the Schrodinger equation is uh, the equation you see here. Once you decide for a Hamiltonian H that is going to describe your model. Okay, so that's about one particle, but uh, uh, what we're actually interested in here, since we want to describe macroscopic transport property, these are going to be systems with infinitely many particles. Okay, and in the interesting case, which is in fact the case we're going to discuss, the quantum nature of the, of the dynamics of the system will actually survive the macroscopic scale and it will give rise to a prediction which is drastically different from what you would have for class, from classical dynamics. All right, so let's start with the whole effect. So, and let me start from the classical whole effect that dates back to 19th century. So the setting is the following. You, you were talking about, um, you know, charge carriers confined on a very thin material. You can idealize that as a two-dimensional sample, right, as in this picture. And then what you want to do here, you want to include a transverse magnetic field that comes out of the screen and a weak electric field that is going to be applied as along this, this arrow here. Right, so if you just apply the laws of uh, electrodynamics, then we all know that this electric field is going to push the charges along J1. But now, due to the presence of B, there's going to be a drift orthogonal to E due to the Lorentz force. Okay, so that's the Lorentz force that is there because of the magnetic field. So this, in particular, will produce an accumulation of charges on the two opposite sides of this lab. So that's about the classical Hall effect, and actually you can, uh, uh, well, you can say quite a bit about it from the classical viewpoint in the case in which this electric field is small. Okay, so I want to discuss the linear response approximation. So in this approximation, what you do, you, you essentially, uh, 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 you know, you, you study the, the current as a linear function of E, you neglect higher orders. And uh, uh, in this linear response approximation, what you have is that uh, the current is going to be proportional to E up to some constants which are called conductivities. Okay, so sigma 1, 1 is called the longitudinal conductivity, sigma 2, 1 is called the transverse conductivity. And what we're going to talk about is the transverse conductivity because something inter interesting is going to happen there. So that's something you can uh, try to uh, study from uh, uh, the point of view of classical electrodynamics. I mean, if you just take a models for non-interacting point-like particles with a charge and you just write down uh, Maxwell's equation, you, actually can, you, you will actually find out that uh, the sigma 2, 1 is proportional to the density of charge carriers rho. Okay, so there are a bunch of constants here which are the charge uh, of the electron squared. There is a Planck constant which actually is actually not really there because it cancels with this other guy, but you will see in a moment why I'm putting it here. And then there is a the magnetic field and the speed of light. Okay, so that's what you have. So that's a very simple and I would say a little boring prediction. That's in fact the linear behavior that you would expect from classical physics. So that prediction turns out to be uh, very different from what you can actually measure in uh, experiments at extreme conditions. And that was a discovery of uh, Klaus von Klitzing at the beginning of the 80s. Okay, so, so what he did was to study the whole effect in a suitable class of materials that are called insulators. We're going to de define them mathematically in a moment. And he did it in a very extreme setting. So the magnetic field was very large and the temperature was extremely, extremely small. So that's precisely the setting in which quantum mechanics is, is expected to play a role. And so what he discovered is that uh, this uh, transverse conductivity, instead of being linear in the density of charge carriers, it was given by a series of sharply quantized plateaus. And there is another side of this graph, which is about the longitudinal conductivity. That's exactly zero in correspondence of the plateau. That defines an insulating phase from an experimental point of view. And at the transition between one plateau to another, it, was, uh, it had a spike and then it was going to zero again and so on. Okay, so that's, a, that's a, the observation of von Klitzing. This is, a, in fact, a picture of experimental data. That's not a plot. These are really the data of uh, such an experiment for the resistivity matrix, which is the inverse of the conductivity matrix. Right, so that's a beautiful uh, uh, observation, totally different from what you would expect classically. And uh, the integer quantum mole effect is the statement that uh, the transverse conductivity takes only quantized values in units on a fundamental constant, which is E squared over H. 
Okay, so, so this is something that it's, I mean, it's not an approximation. These integers are really, are really there. So the, the, the experiment really gives integers that are uh, uh, precise with uh, 10, to the minus nine, 10 to the minus 9 precision, which is actually due to our experimental apparatus. It's, uh, it's really a, a remarkable, one of the most precise measurements you can make in physics. Okay, so that's it's a purely quantum phenomenon. Classic, classical mechanics will not give you that. And uh, nowadays, we, we acknowledge that as the first example of what we call a topological insulator. So this integer here has a topological meaning, and topological insulators are materials whose transfer properties can be, and the stability of the transfer properties can be understood via topological, topological ideas. All right, so that's uh, um, the, the phenomenon. And uh, um, in the remaining time, I would like to give you somehow an overview, an idea of uh, how, you know, what, what, what can a mathemat mathematical physicist do there, and what are the kind of theorems one can prove. Okay, so first of all, what is the setting? Well, we want to describe electrons that hop on an infinite two-dimensional crystal, okay? And we can approximate that by a periodic lattice that extends in all directions, let's say Z2, as in this picture. Okay, so this is our crystal. These black dots are the, the atoms that form the crystal, and we look for electrons hopping from atom to atom. Okay, so that's a tight binding approximation. And what are the other, the other elements we need? Well, one thing we need is the transverse magnetic field that you see here. It's coming out of the screen. Another thing we need is to allow the electron to hop. So we want to introduce at some point a hopping operator that allows to jump from one side to another one. And the last thing we, we consider is a local potential that could do many things. It could include a periodic potential, but it could also describe the presence of impurities. So if you let this V to be a random multiplication operator, that describes the presence of impurities in the system. So let's put all these things together. Let's come up with a Hamiltonian, right? So that would be a Hamiltonian for one electron hopping on this uh, lattice. So we have a Laplacian, which we couple to an external field. We do that in a gauge invariant way on a lattice. That's uh, the prescription to do that. And this A is a vector potential, which has the role of generating the magnetic flux. So if you integrate it over a plaquette, you get the flux that comes out of, the, uh, comes out of that plaquette. What about V? Well, V is a multiplication operator that acts uh, as, as written here. All right, so that's about the Hamiltonian for one electron, but actually what we're interested in is a state with infinitely many particles. So we would like to consider the ground state of this Hamiltonian for infinitely many particles. Okay, so how does one do that? Well, one fills the Fermi C. Right? So what does that mean? Well, it means that since our particles are fermions, every fermion will occupy, uh, if you want, an eigenstate of this Hamiltonian, if this would add a discrete spectrum, in, in general it does not have a discrete spectrum, but that's the idea, right? So you fill all the energy levels up to a certain mu, and this mu will define the Fermi energy of your system. Okay, so mathematically, defining a state means that you give a rule on how to compute expectation values. And uh, uh, in the case of uh, non-interacting fermions, this is uh, determined by this operator P, which is our Fermi projector. Okay, so it's an operator that projects over all the states uh, uh, that are below a certain energy mu. Okay, so this can actually be justified by introducing the proper Gibbs measure for non-interacting fermions and taking the zero temperature limit. So that's about uh, the ground state of the system, non-interacting fermions. I will introduce in interactions uh, at the very end of the presentation. And so there is an important assumption you have to make here to capture this insulating behavior. So that mathematically uh, translates into requiring that correlations decay fast. Okay, so the fast decay of correlations is uh, Quantit quantitatively introduced by this exponential decay of the Fermi projector. Okay, so this is a, 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 it's an estimate which is true if, uh, in particular, the Fermi energy does not belong to the spectrum of H, so it belongs to a spectral gap. We're going to assume that for the moment. Or it can also be true in a more subtle way if mu belongs to what is called the mobility gap that's going to be relevant for disordered systems. Right, so that's about uh, somehow the equilibrium problem, but of course we want to drive a dynamics here. So how do we do that? We want to include an electric field. And so the way to do that, uh, to include an electric field, is to add some time dependence to the, to the vector potential. Right, so we can do that as done here. So this eta is going to be a small parameter that is going to make this electric field slowly vary. Okay, so we introduce it at time t equal to minus infinity, and we make a measurement at time t equal to zero. So this is going to drive uh, the system, it's going to introduce a non-trivial evolution, and the evolution for the state uh, is uh, the analog of the Schrodinger equation for the Fermi projector, what you see here. All right, so that's our dynamics. And the, the main goal of the business is to understand the average of the current operator. So what is the current operator? It's just a derivative of position in a quantum mechanical setting. So commutator of, H with, uh, uh, commutator of uh, x with ih, all right? 
So that's the current operator after you normalize it. So you first evaluate it on a finite box, and then you divide by the size, and then you take the box to infinity. That's because you want to have an intensive quantity at the end. Right, so the, the, the difficult problem is to understand the e-dependence of this guy, in particular to justify the integer quantum mole effect. So first thing you can try to do is to uh, try to do a perturbative expansion of the state. This is something one can do. I mean, naive perturbation theory is something you can apply to this uh, evolution equation. And actually, that can be justified. In case you have a gap, you can actually prove that uh, the higher order terms are actually really smaller. OK, so you can justify linear response. And you get a prediction for the current, which is going to be linear in E, times uh, uh, you know, this matrix, sigma, which is our conductivity matrix, which takes a certain expression, something that only depends on equilibrium uh, objects, like the Fermi projector, which, uh, um, OK, we would like to compute. OK, so that's uh, what you get out, to, out of this uh, perturbative analysis. So to get some more insight, let's uh, uh, consider a simplified setting in which we suppose that the system is translation invariant. Okay, so to try to understand what is the sigma 1, 2. So translation invariance means the following thing. Now our Hamiltonian is going to be an operator on L2 of uh, Z2, right? And we also introduce some internal degree of freedom. That's just to make it more general. And so what we suppose is that the kernel of this matrix, of this infinite matrix, it just depends on the difference of the arguments. Okay, so that's what we're assuming. So now what you can do, you can take the Fourier transform of this, of this guy, you can introduce the so-called block Hamiltonian, that's a Hamiltonian for fermions with a given momentum k, and since we're on a lattice, this momentum is a point on the two-dimensional torus, right? And you can look at the eigenvalue problem, so you can just try to compute the eigenvalues in the eigenstates of this block Hamiltonian, and that's uh, the equation you should solve, right? So, so these EI, these are certain eigenvalues that are parameterized by k, as k varies on the torus, you get some, you know, some manifolds, as in this picture here, Right, so this is a picture for the energy bands as a function of k. And phi is instead, uh, well, it's related to the wave function of your, of your particle. That's the so-called block function. Okay, again, it's a function of k. So we're supposing that we have a spectral gap. So suppose in this example, we have two bands that are separated by a gap, and we're placing the Fermi level inside. So we're, we're populating all the energy levels below this, uh, this energy mean. OK, so then let's look at the Fermi projector. Or you can also diagonalize that in momentum space, right? So, and, uh, and let's, let's make the very simple uh, assumption. And I mean, this, uh, I mean, let's simplify the problem by just asking that for a given k, the Fermi projector is rank 1. OK, so we're just populating one band. OK, so that's uh, as in the previous picture. So in this setting, you can actually compute the sigma 1, 2. That's uh, the quantity I gave you before. And it, it, gets, uh, it takes a very explicit form. It becomes, it becomes equal to the integral over the two torus of the curl of a certain vector field. Okay, so this curl is a two-dimensional curl, so this is a scalar. And uh, um, this, uh, um, this vector field here is also called the Berry connection. It's in fact related to what we heard this morning at Martin Heider's uh, lecture. So what do you see from this expression? Well, what you see is that uh, if phi is regular enough, then you could just apply Stokes' theorem, and you would just get zero, because you're applying Stokes' theorem on a domain with no boundary. So that you just get a trivial conductivity. So in a sense, it is telling you that the regularity of the block function actually implies vanishing of, uh, of this transverse transport. But what can happen in general is that this phi k is not so smooth. It might have some singularities. And in that case, this integral actually captures uh, essentially the winding of the phase of the block function around those singularities. So this quantization here is a quantization that you should understand as a sum of winding numbers, which are, of course, topological objects. Right? So that's, in a sense, the topological meaning that is carried by this object. So that's really the simplest uh, version of this uh, quantization. This can be lifted. Of course, you can consider a more general case in which a Fermi projector has a general rank. And then what you discover is that the sigma 1, 2 is equal to the churn number of a suitable vector bound, which is defined here. OK, so this uh, observation dates back to the pioneering work of Taules, uh, Komoto, Nightingale, and Denise in the 80s. And then it has been made rigorous by a group of mathematical physicists, uh, Avram Seiler and Sam. So this is a nice story, but it's all about uh, uh, translation invariant system with a gap. Now, what's missing here is the plateau, right? So what we're actually able to prove here is quantization. But actually, what we would like to do is also to show that we have those plateaus in the plot of the conductivity. And here, we cannot do that, because if, you, if our Fermi level is in a gap, changing the density means changing the Fermi level. And if you change it where there is no spectrum, you're not populating more states. That's just going to stay constant, the number of occupied states. So you cannot see those plateaus. To see plateaus, you need to populate the spectrum with states. And the way in which this happens is via Anderson localization, which was another breakthrough in mathematical physics. Essentially, the, the, the existence of plateaus requires the presence of disorder. So 
impurities in the system, instead of blurring the effect, they make it sharper, which is unusual for, for anything, I mean, I would say in physics. Right, so essentially what happens is that, is, is that if you have a strong enough uh, random potential, then one can prove that if you look at an interval around mu, let's say the spectral gap, with probability one, this is going to be filled by pure point spectrum. And the remarkable thing is that the previous computation, which was very simple, can be extended to, the trans to, the, to this non-translation invariant case. And one can prove that sigma 1, 2 is an integer also there, and it's continuous in mu. So an integer that is continuous in, in, in the parameter is actually a constant, and that's a plateau. Okay, so all of this, uh, it's, uh, uh, in a sense, really explains the integer quantum Hall effect for non-interacting fermions. That was a, a, a triumph of mathematical physics in the 80s and in the 90s. It pioneered the study of topological insulators and the definition of topological phases of matter that we hear a lot about it today. And uh, um, it has, however, a limitation. The limitation is that uh, in this picture, many body interactions are gone. So this picture describes very well what happens, but without neglecting something that we know is there, is the, repul the repulsion among the charge cardinals. So recently, there has been progress about it. Uh, nowadays, we know how to prove that this effect is stable against uh, weak many body interactions. But there are uh, many interesting open questions which we still would like to understand. One in particular is about the existence of plateaus for many body systems. So you would like to have many body interaction and disorder. That's a very difficult problem because uh, somehow it presupposes that you're able to understand localization for interacting system, which mathematically is very hard. And the other property, the other problem is to understand what happens for strong interactions. I mean, what physicists know and what mat mathematicians not, are not able to prove nowadays is that uh, if you have strong interactions, the conductivity should become uh, uh, rational, right? So you become a fraction. While, uh, and to, to get that, you definitely need somehow some very non-perturbative phenomenon to take place. And this is really beyond the realm of what one can do rigorously on this um, topic. Okay, so I will stop here and thank you for your attention. Thanks a lot to all of the session organizers who kindly agreed to do the exercise because 15 minutes is definitely very short. Um, we now have 10 minutes to switch to the, se the parallel sessions. Um, you will find volunteers to help you find the rooms you want to reach. If you are a speaker, please go straight to the lectern when you arrive in your room so we can put your presentation on the laptop. Thank you.